time to hear your testimonies and come in after being on the field and hear someone testify. I'm certainly happy to see Brother Jeffries, I call him Creechy there. I didn't know he was in the meeting. Now, I know this means a lot to you, too, from coming from the battlefield, from where the lights are low, and come in under this nice atmosphere of Christians and people all together and free in the Spirit. I, I like this, for people are free, they have a free feeling. And uh, it's something about it. We just don't try to act starchy. They're just, it's, they used to say, take off your collar and feel at home. Uh, I like that. I'm sure we all do, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking when I looked over here at my daughter, Rebecca, I remember one time being off in a meeting. And uh, she was a little fellow then. Her and she's got a little sister four years smaller. And so Becky's blue-eyed and kind of tall, and Sarah was brown-eyed and kind of short. So they was both daddy's girls. And I really love children, and the Lord gave me some fine children. And so they was waiting to see me. When I come in, they wanted to play with me a little bit. So the Sandman got in their eyes, and they had to go to sleep along about 12 or 1 o'clock, and the plane didn't get into around maybe 2 or 3 in the morning. And I went in to lay down couldn't sleep. I just got out in the living room, sat down in the chair. It's a little joke kind of I tell on them. And it was uh, after a while, daylight come and Rebecca here woke up and she knew that I should be home. And, and she looked over and seen Sarah still asleep. So she looked out and seen me sitting in the room and here she come, just as hard as she could. And uh, jumped up on my lap, both arms. And about that time, Sarah, her a little sister uh, woke up. Well, she looked, but Becky had already beat her to me. So kind of comparing this with the church that's been a long time, and Becky was kind of thin, long-legged, and she could sit on my lap real good, and both feet hit the floor. She's balanced up pretty well, you know. I say this kind of for our Methodist brother over here. Been a long time around, you know, and growed up a little. Well, Sarah was a little short and I don't know whether your children does or not. Mine does. One will, the oldest one will get something new and then it'll go down to the next one and then down to the next one. And, and Sarah had on Becky's pajamas and it was these rabbit feeted pajamas they used to have, you know, kind of big and her little feet couldn't pack it very well. So she started through the house and Rebecca threw her arms around me and she turned around, looked back to Sarah and she said, Sarah, my sister, I want you to know that I got here first. She said, and I've got all of daddy, and there's nothing left for you. <laughs> well, Sarah kind of felt a little stepped on, you know, so her little lips turned down, and um, kind of reminds me of maybe the church just has been on the road a long time, you know, they've got all the ins and outs of it, and they can sit down with all the theology and explain it and speak it in Greek and so forth. I'd compare that with Rebecca. So then Sarah looks around, her little lips dropped, and she turned and started back in the room. I kind of winked my eye at her and motioned like that and stuck my other leg out. That's just what she's waiting for. <laughs> Here she comes. Jumped up on this leg, and she was little legs were short, you know, and she couldn't hit the floor. She was kind of topsy-turvy. So I just threw my arms around her to keep her from falling, hugged her up close to me. She put her head up on my chest and laid there a little bit. She looked around to Rebecca. She said, and Rebecca, my sister, so I want you to understand something, too. It may be so that you were there first, and you may have all of Daddy, but I want you to know Daddy's got all of me. So, <laughs> so that's about the way it is. I, you know, I may not know all the ins and outs, but as long as he's got all of me, <laughs> that's all we care about. Just let him take us and use us the way he wishes to. I certainly appreciate this stay here and this fine fellowship among these fine brethren, ministers, all the cooperation of the personal workers and everything that's been done for the Ramada and for their fine cooperation. And I'm only sorry that it's just this four days. See, you just get to knowing the people, and the people begin to know you, and then, um, then you have to leave. 
right when really something could be done to, to really magnify God. And the things that goes on might have been new to many of you. And you wouldn't understand it. You can't explain the thing in just a night or two. And then if you get settled down, of course you could. Many things went on. You pastors remember that in your churches, weeks to come, there'll be women coming to you saying, you know, I had a female disorder. It's gone. One, I had a stomach trouble. It's gone. I couldn't call it all. It's just everywhere. Faith just jumping everywhere. For instance, a few moments ago, there was a, a man come up here and, and uh, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, uh, I looked up at the man. I thought, I ought to, ought to know that man. I'd seen him somewhere. And he said, uh, you remember me? And I don't believe I do. So then he said, I was in your meeting in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in 40 by 42 or something like that. Way back many years ago. And I said, yes. And I thought, I've seen that man somewhere, but I can't place it. And um, so we went ahead, he went ahead talking. In a few moments, I began to recognize that a few nights ago in the meeting, there was a, a lady, I believe she was kind of a gray-headed woman standing on the platform. And if I would be facing the east, which is really a traditional that I just like to face the east because he's coming from the east. When I baptize, I usually baptize in that way and look like the always to my right side because each time that this light comes in, it comes from the right side. And so I always uh, try to keep the people coming to me from the right side. And I'd be standing kind of this way, I suppose, positionally now, the way the building is seated up there. And down to my left, I noticed standing by me a woman uh, much younger than the woman was standing before me. And she had pink uh, clothes on. It was different from the woman standing there. I kept noticing, and I dropped down, and I, there's no way to explain it. You just have to believe it, that's all. I looked down, and there's a lady sitting down here, right to my left, and she was kind of a... Uh, something was wrong with her. And I looked back, and then here stood a man by her. I thought, there's something... Strange, and I was trying to keep my mind to the woman I was talking to because, you see, maybe if you watch something happen, see, it might be telling this woman what this woman had, see. So you, it's very, and Satan's laying right there for every opportunity he can. It's just grace of God, see, that he lets that happen. And then I, I look and I seen this woman kind of, one is much younger than the other, and one woman was kind of a, had a she was tore up mentally disturbed. And the other woman had some kind of a affliction really bad. And then this man, and come to find out this morning when I st stood here, that was the man. And I said, haven't you got a wife that's, uh, that's sick, that's uh, mentally disturbed, oppressed like? And he said, yes. And I said, was she in the meeting night before last and sat down to my left wearing some kind of a pink dress or something? said, yes. And that was her, and that's how I recognized the man. Now, I, believe I, I believe I wrote his name down. Now I'm getting, can't remember too well. A uh, pastor, M-A-C-K, uh, he sat down right here somewhere. And uh, that was right, wasn't it? And he told me, he said, my wife many years ago was in your meeting and was instantly healed by a miracle that she was telling her about. And uh, tell her about her troubles, and she was instantly healed. Uh, me, a couple times, a uh, rare blood disease and uh, ulcers and things like that. Now, see what happened. If I could try to let you see what I mean, the lady had faith. See, in her faith, she was believing. Yet, probably with no prayer card or nothing, but she was believing, and maybe stronger than the lady was sitting before me. And now. I believe he said that his wife come in, and I, if I'm not mistaken, that's her sitting right there by the man. And that is the woman. That's the woman. Um, uh, to look at her, that's, that's the lady. All right. Now you see how the, the grace of God uh, to that. The lady actually really believed with all of her heart, and her faith was so much greater than the person standing here, it went to her. Of course, now and then the man asked me, he said, Brother Branham, is there anything seriously wrong with my wife? Will she be well or something? I said, Sir, I don't know. See, you are the one who makes that vision. 
Your own faith does that. See? Your faith does it. Not mine. It's you. See? Jesus standing there before those people. Uh, and this woman touched his garment. He didn't even know who touched him. He said, who touched me? Uh, Jesus wouldn't say anything just to be saying. He really, he didn't know who did it. And he looked around over the audience until he found that woman. See? And then he told her about what faith she had. Now, I, I wouldn't know. And then sometimes, see, this wasn't explained, I suppose. But now, see, what you, what you are, what's wrong with you, that's the Holy Spirit revealing that. And sometimes I watch it. It turns dark, shadowy. I just don't say nothing because it's perhaps death. And so I just say, go, the Lord bless you. And maybe if you stay long enough, just wait there. See what the Lord says. And then that's what he's saying. Now, that's what, that the vision has showed what's wrong with you or what you've done. But then stay still and wait. I notice the people just walk away. See, stay still. Just stand there and wait and see what he says. And then you find out if it comes back and I see a vision of what you are going to be. That shows what you have been. Then if I can see what you're going to be, you'll notice it. It's always thus saith the Lord. And then, then you mark that down and see if that don't happen just like that. It'll never fail. If a vision, here's what I have confidence. If the vision come told me this morning that George Washington was going to rise out of the presidential graveyard for me to go there and call him, I'd invite the world to come see it done. Right? It would not fail. It cannot fail. It never has. And it never will as long as you don't try to use your impression. And now many times I think we're all Pentecostal here this morning, aren't we? Uh, many times where I think that people get enthused, you see. You get an impression that the Lord said so and so. And you say it when really it's not. And that would be wrong to say that. See, You wait until you know that God has definitely spoken. It'll be perfect each time. But if you're just impressed to say that, you might say it. But And when you do that, that causes something like a carnal impersonation. And it, you really, brother, sister, it doesn't help God. It hinders God. See? And maybe God calls you to be a, a witness or something else. Then you stay true to what God tells you to do. Be a true witness. Now, this has been a great meeting. One of the finest bunch of faith behind me of them ministers that I ever sat with. And the people out in the audience has been wonderful. And I'm only sorry that we just have to close off so quick uh, this way. But I hope someday, if it be the will of the Lord, to be back. I guess the manager here, Brother Borders, was um, uh, introduced to the people. And I'd just like for him to stand up. Brother Roy Borders has been with me in a many great struggle. Would you just stand, Brother Borders? He very humble. Brother Borders don't know this, but it hit me again. I'm going to tell him now. And uh, Brother Borders is a sick man. I just got to meet him, at, go, go with him after this service this morning. Brother Borders, I hope it don't shock you. But the Lord must touch Brother Borders right away. He's got a vow closing in his heart. That's exactly right. I never spoke to him anymore what you see me on the platform, but that's true. Now, I'm going to tell this woman while the Holy Spirit's on me. Now, I've got to quit then, see, because it's just beginning to move. This lady is sitting over here now looking this way. That man asked, it's nothing serious. It's a change of life. Just a menopause, a weary, dreary feeling, and all mixed up. You'll be all right. Don't fear. That's just what it is. Now, the great Holy Spirit in his presence. I got a little girl here that this man you spoke of. I got some things written down here. Uh, a little girl... Uh, was operated on at Phoenix yesterday, a kidney removed or something from a, a brother outlaw's church. A man that's everywhere I go, if it's in the range of 102 miles, a man attends every meeting. And one of the members of his congregation is here this morning, and a little girl operated on for a tumor on the kidney, and it's malignant. Only God can save that child's life. A little deaf girl that Brother Jenkins has spoke of. Oh, there's just so much that's sick and needy. And now, just before we 
go to the speaking part of the service, I, I'd less like for us to pray a moment. Let's bow our heads. And if there's other requests, just raise your hand. Our Heavenly Father, we are taught in the great divine scriptures, inspired words of God put in print, that we would be seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we feel that this morning to see a a heaven-bound group of people made up of all different denominations setting together. So look out upon them and see some of the man that's older than I, some young man coming on, and just as the leaves and the flowers and all nature works, the old moves off, the young moves in. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the Holy Spirit that gives us this great assurance that some great day we'll meet again. We thank Thee for His great power. He helps our infirmities. And we pray for this little girl that's, that's had this uh, removed uh, tumor out of the kidney, and it's cancerous. Lord God, be merciful to this little girl. Uh, think, what if it was my child? It's somebody's darling. I pray that you heal it. May the power of Satan be taken from it. May that child live to the glory of God. Bless, I pray this morning, the little deaf girl that was mentioned. Pray that you'll give the hearing back to that little girl, little Jenkins girl. I pray, Heavenly Father, for Brother Borders, my precious brother. As we see Satan trying to take him off of the field, God, we claim him for the kingdom's sake. And we pray for all these special requests and for this uh, lady that the other night standing there, that faith moving up. Now you have explained it to her, Lord, and now it will be all right. We thank you for this. We pray that you'll continue to be with us. Bless these ministers. Bless all that's helped, the musicians, this little quartet that's singing, and the quartet from the church over there, them fine young men. For the lady, give us the specials and all these things, Lord. They're they're too much to remember in our mind, but Thou knowest them all. For this Ramada Inn, for that fine man that stood here a few moments ago and saying, God bless you. God, we pray that it will turn to Him. And that He may, Lord, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Become a great witness in the world of Jesus Christ. Greatest thing that could happen, Father. Now we pray that you'll bless Brother Tony and these fine uh, men here, even being uh, uh, of the lay members of the church. And the, yet they're trying to, the businessmen, to organize themselves together to make a, another witness. God grant their efforts. Be Fill with the Spirit and discerning of knowing what to do and how to do to act for the Lord Jesus. Bless the message this morning, Lord, as I speak, and I pray that you'll anoint it with your blessings. And when we go away, we can say like those who came from Emmaus, our hearts burned along the way. And then, Father, if there be an unsaved person in here, one who doesn't know you, or just a church member. May the great power of the Holy Spirit reveal to them their need today of salvation through God's appropriated way, the only way, Jesus Christ. For we ask it in His name. Amen. Um, Thank you again. One thing I forgot to mention a while ago, Brother... Tony, as he stepped out to the car last evening, he said, I said, I never look at my, I am been in the ministry now some 33 years. I pastored the tabernacle at Jeffersonville for 17 years, never had one penny salary, and I never took up an offering all the days of my life, never did take, never intend to take one. 
And last night, Brother Tony said that they was, um, uh, I said, did you make the expenses? The understanding when I met with this fine brother Brock, and, and uh, did I pronounce that right, Brock? And um, Brother Gilmore and some of the other brethren up there the other night, I said, now, they asked about the finance uh, uh, condition. I said, just whatever the expenses are, that's all there is to it. Well, he said, we want to take you an offering. I said, no, no I don't do that. I, I, I get uh, I get $100 a week from the church, and that takes care of it. And I said, I, what are all I need, I, I don't need nothing. See, I, I'm thinking about this over on the other side there. There's nothing over there. And I know that... That I tried to keep my ministry so many has come and the manager saying, Brother Branham, it ought to be in bright lights. And the president of the Four Rolls Whiskey was over to our place here some time ago and she brought her daughter and she said, um, all, uh, the little girl wanted to be healed and she said uh, she'd heard about it and she's going to have an operation. And so they said, uh, oh, uh, she wanted to come over, she didn't want to be operated on. Well, she run right in while I was speaking and wanted to be prayed for right then. Had to be right then. Well, uh, she couldn't stay. Her mother was after her. So mother come in the back of the room and sat down with that arrogant look. So then we come up, prayed for the little girl and went back. Well, a couple of days after that, the doctor had said, said, all right, it's a bunch of foolishness. Said, but she said, no, I feel fine. No appendicitis to me. I'm fine and dandy. So then they went on. Four or five days after a while, you see, just as I explained it, after about 72 hours, that symptom re reoccurs again if you really got healed. See? Healing, I'm not talking about miracle. And it reoccurred because the appendix began to swell. And the doctor said, now, you see, now you better go get that holy roller preacher again. <laughs> so then uh, he wouldn't operate. But of course, when there's about $1,500 involved, he, he, he could do it. He said he wouldn't, but he did it. And it had to be a friend of mine on that staff. That when they removed, opened the girl up to take the appendix out, there was nothing wrong. See? They operated for nothing. They just left the appendix there because it wasn't even uh, affected in no way. And the doctor come told me about it, a friend of mine on that staff that helped operate. Now, you see what it was? She was all excited and didn't know just how to hold on to that faith. Yeah. See? And there we don't get a chance to explain that. Then that made the, my doctor friend told a mother and said the appendix is still there. It said she needed that appendix and it wasn't infected. There was nothing to it at all. Just perfectly normal, pink, just mm -hmm. all like it should be. And the mother became a believer. Then she says to me, "What needs to be done is your ministry is not set out in the corner with a bunch of." Of just ordinary people. It should be flashed across the country everywhere. It should be on billboards. Now, that's just what the devil wants. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. See? But no, I don't want it like that. I, I want so I can just visit anywhere. do any, Wherever the Lord calls, that's where I want to go. Yeah. That's where you get, just keep it humble and let the Lord move us wherever He wishes to move us. Yeah. And now, to you people, if, you, if it's been prayed for, if you, after about... 72 hours corruption sets in. We know that mortification sets in after 72 hours. If something reoccurs, if you really believe that with all your heart, there's nothing going to stop it. You believe it anyhow. Yeah. Stay right with it. It'll be all right, don't you? But you can't bluff it now. You've got to really know it, that it's done. See, there's a lot of difference between hope and faith. A hope, just hope's part, faith knows it's done. So that's the difference. Now, this morning... I don't want to keep, it's already 10 o'clock and few, about six minutes after by this watch that Billy gave to me. And I, I want to read a verse out of the book of Isaiah, the first chapter, for just a little comments. And I got some scriptures written down here that I might refer to and just keep you about uh, 30 minutes and then we'll be ready to go, the Lord willing. Isaiah, the first chapter and the 18th verse. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. Now, the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. And I want to speak on the subject of conferences, holding a conference. Lord Bless the word now, and may the seeds fall in our hearts where we have need. And Lord, may mine be open with everyone here that we might understand the hour that we're living and what we should do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Speaking of conferences, 
We, we hear of so much of it in these days. Everything is a conference. And frankly, that's what we're here this morning in, is a conference. And uh, we hear so much of them in so many different places they're held, so many things that's accomplished by conferences. I think that it's a thing we should do, is to have a conference. And uh, usually when they're held in the times of emergencies, Usually when an emergency is on, then you hold a conference. You call it a quick conference. And we think of it in that terms. Now, here, many of you can remember the, for instance, a conference we had in the world crises when uh, Germany and the rest of the world was at war, when President uh, Roosevelt was president of the United States, and, and uh, there was... Uh, uh, the other great four, they call it, they held what they call the Big Four Conference, the Churchill, and they met together and they had to have what they call the Big Four Conference of the Free World because that they had to come together and pool their uh, ideas together and get in a strategy of somewhere because the enemy was advancing and he, he must be stopped. And then uh, they, they was to get together so they could ever the wisest of the groups and then want to get one's idea and the other's idea and then pool it together and see what they come out with. That was the big four conference and where they should strike back, where they should put their armies, uh, certain like the fifth army and the fourth army and the tenth army and so forth and how they could work together and where the enemy had his stronghold. And if you notice, they always try to hit that spinal cord. That's the lifeline. And it's always strike the enemy. If you want to kill it, you must strike it in a vital spot. If you don't, you don't kill it. And so, uh, therefore, just one thing to be done, just like setting a meeting, if we could take uh, the kingdom of God, as man has said many times in the ministry, and like quoting back to the woman, said, if you'd take and get all the great people together, the great uh, minds, and set it together, and then strike it from right there. But you see, you're striking at the wrong thing. Yes. See, if I can get ministers together, if I can get a group of God saved man together, and let them see the power that's in Christ Jesus, that and he actually lives in our hearts and can know the thoughts of the mind and foretell and tell forth and, and make it be perfect, then those ministers will be inspired and they'll take it to their people. and See what I mean? There's the place to strike, where the guns are setting. Now, and in the big four, they had that great conference. Then we had a, another conference that was called the Geneva Conference. I'm sure many of you remember when they had to have the, the Geneva Conference. And there was another one called the Paris Conference. When they met in Paris, it's just constantly, all the time, conference after conference after conference, meeting together because the need is great in national life. The, the brain of the world seems to be so entangled. That, uh, you just don't know where, what to do, and the whole world is scared to death right now. It reminds me of a little boy going home in a dark night, going through the graveyard, whistling. He just whistles as hard as he can because he's merely a calling a bluff to himself. He, he don't want to think that he's scared, but he's whistling to try to relax himself. But down in the bottom of it, he's scared behind every tombstone is a goblin or uh, see, he's scared and he's whistling just to kind of quieten himself. And that's why we have so much Tommy rot today on the radio and television of man like uh, a man who's got talents, singers like Ernie Ford and Elvis Presley, those boys who's selling out their birthrights for a mess of pottage yeah. to get out there and all you have to be is a jokester or turn some cracker or something like that to make the American public laugh. 
when you know you're only trying to quiet them and you know behind it all, we know that judgment is at hand. Yeah. Right. right. Might as well face it. We're at the end of the road, brethren. And all the Ernie Ford jokes and the Elvis Presley rock and rolls and all this stuff is another Nebuchadnezzar's feast. Amen. It won't do a bit of good. Judgment is going to strike. This nation has come to the same place like Sodom and Gomorrah. And the just God would let this country get by with what it's doing now as a just God. He'd be morally obligated to raise up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for burning them up. Amen. Right. If we get by without the judgment. But just remember, it's coming to us. You flee to the rock as quick as you can. Don't put it off. Don't notice what all these just joining church and creed and so forth do like these Methodist brethren here. Flee to the rock until something echoes back that you see Christ reflecting. It might have to beat you a little. In the old Bible times when the uh, they, nowadays here in this gold state of Arizona, in the old, they got smelters now that smelt out the iron and the pyrite, what's called fool's gold, and smelt that out from the real gold by a smelter. In the old days, the only way they had to separate it was a beater, beat the gold with a hammer like the Indians beat it. And the only way that the beater knew that he had the gold ready was when he beat all the dross out of it, and he'd beat it and turn it over and beat it and beat it until all the dross went out. When he seen his own self reflect back into the, the gold, he knew then that all of the dirt and the iron and the foreign matters was out of the gold. And that's the way God is trying to do his church, is to beat it till all the creeds and the nonsense and all the world is beat out of it till it reflects back the life of Jesus Christ. Remember... The church have just come off of the great meeting at home where the six seals and that six seal or seven seals and that sixth one was the purification of the church. The church, of course, goes through the tribulation period for it's purifying, but the bride is raptured. There's a difference between the bride and the church. I hope I don't get doctrinated here now. If I say anything that you don't believe, why well, do it just like I do when I'm eating cherry pie. Uh, I love cherry pie, but when I hit a seed, I never throw the pie away. I just throw the seed away. So you do the same thing. Eating chicken, when you hit the bone, you don't throw the chicken away. You just throw the bone away. And if I say something you don't believe, just throw the bone away. You see. Now, but these emergencies and crisis is on. And constantly it's calling the president, the, the final the conferences, and they have to meet for this or that, and Cuba will fly out, and then they have to call a conference, and something else will fly out, and they have to call a conference. All we hear about nearly is conference. What do they do at a conference? How's it made up? First thing, they uh, call together and then select a certain place. Uh, in Geneva, I've been there. That's a, a great, beautiful place. And they usually try to get to a place kind of inspiring so that they can get there and then uh, select this place, call all the great men into this one place and make... Uh, I haven't got a row down here. Where was that place in Switzerland we went down there, Billy? Where they had, that was uh, Geneva, wasn't it? And I think it was a, a beautiful country. I didn't write down the, the name of that conference, but I remember being there. And they meet and have these places. And they select the best they can and work upon them. Now, that's of the world. And everything that's wrong, everything that's in the world, it, it's wrong, is a type of the right. Now, sin itself is only righteousness perverted. Now, there's only one creator, and that's God. And Satan is not a creator. He's only a perverter of original creation. Amen. A lie is the truth misrepresented. Adultery is the right act misused. Everything is always a perversion of what's right. Satan can pervert, but he cannot create. 
see? And, and we remember that, that the wrong, a lie, or anything that's sin is righteousness perverted. And so we find that Satan always takes a type for what he's going to do off of what God has done. For instance, like many people seeing the meeting, they say it's a telepathy or it's a, the man is a, a was called a, what, a Simon the Sorcerer and, and uh, something like that. See, why, when you see a, a, a spiritless or a devil act, it's only a perversion of a real genuine thing that God has. Amen. Right. See, this, and man ought to be, uh, ought to know enough and spiritual enough to be able to discern between what's right and wrong. Did you ever hear of a spiritualist casting out devils and, and healing the sick and preaching the gospel? <laughs> By their fruits they are known. They got some little stand over in a corner somewhere and read the palm of your hand and guess at four or five things and a dozen of it be wrong and there you are. You see, that's just a perversion. Yeah. Trying to draw people's minds it's out of ease, away from the real, genuine Holy Spirit where we can set together in heavenly places and Christ reveal to us what we should do. The churches ought to be that way. The people that speaks in tongues I just want to speak this because I'm your father, as it was. I'm going to act as that this morning. See, we got a great thing, but it's, it's, I believe that it's not represented just right. See? And it'll sell itself if it's perfectly represented right. Now, I think there's many of these Methodists, these Baptists and Presbyterians, would like to have this, but it's the way we present it to them. See? Now, if you see a fellow out building a house and got a hammer and he's putting nails in the house, you walk up and you've got a machine that you can put a half a keg of nails in it and rrr, just nail it up like that twice as quick and a better job. If you walk up to him and tell him, oh, what are you doing? You're old-fashioned. You don't want to do that. That's the wrong way. Here, I've got a machine to do this. Right quick, you have ruined your sale. Yeah. You businessmen know that. You've ruined your sale. The thing to do is go up and brag on him how, how well he can build and then just introduce the product. If it's any good, it'll sell itself. You salesmen know that. And you know there's nothing better than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing better that was given to man out of heaven outside of the Holy Spirit. But you see, we, we try to knock the other fellow down. Let's try to pick him up a little bit and put our arm around him and let him let us know that the blanket stretches all the way across the bed, see? And... Uh, I hold that kind of a conference, you see. Give him a little room, too, but after all, he's, he's struggled. Now, but you see, many times in our churches, we permit people just to raise up even when you're preaching and speaking tongues and making an altar call, somebody speaking tongues and somebody, and give interpretations merely. One of them, I believe, I believe the person is genuinely speaking in tongues, but I believe the other is more or less prophesying because some will speak in tongues maybe for five minutes and the other will give four words of interpretation. See, it has to be at the same sound, the same raise and fall of voice. And then again, if they say it and it doesn't come to pass, then get that evil spirit away from you. Yeah. You don't want yeah. that. Amen. My tabernacle and one speaks like that. He better have it throw down. If it doesn't come to pass, they get that evil spirit out of them. It's got to be exact, not some repeating. Jesus said, don't use vain repetitions as heathens do. It's got to be something directly to somebody or, or to help the church or to help the cause. That's wrote right down. And if it isn't, and the people who speak with tongues and them great gifts to help the body of Christ, they meet hours before we ever get there. And the Holy Spirit works through them and it's put on the desk and we tell out what they've said here. And if it doesn't happen right as it said it did happen, then they cannot do that no more to that evil spirit's out of them. You say, well, Brother Branham, I, well, uh, look, I have to stand up here. I wouldn't be afraid because it's God. Amen. It has to be right every time here. Amen. And it has to be right out there every Amen. time. Amen. Then when people see those things come to pass, then they'll believe. Amen. What the Pentecostal church needs this morning is a good conference. That's exactly right. Amen. All the denominations, the, well, the oneness, two-ness, three-ness, four-ness, and all the rest of us in the Church of God, Assemblies of God, all of us get together and reason these things out. That's right, and get the church moving. As long as Satan can keep you firing at one another, he just sits back and says, Brother, I don't even have to fight. But if we could just get together and look up to God as brethren, then that army united, you don't have to change them one, go to one church and do the 
the way you want to. Them little differences you make is n- uh, no difference anyhow. God give every one of you the Holy Ghost. So the Bible said God gives those the Holy Ghost who obeys Him. So surely somebody's obeyed God. Yes. But the thing is, as long as Satan can keep the little differences, that's what makes the church in such a commotion as it is today. Let's forget that thing and come together and remember the other brothers just as much in Christ as we are. There's no big man, no little man, no superiors. We're children. We're one in Christ. Now our little differences doesn't make any difference whether Becky wants a blue dress and Sarah wants a red one. They're both getting dresses. That, that, see what I mean? So they mustn't argue about that. So I think that's what we, we really should do. Now I'm talking about world conferences, that world crisis. You know, God's had some conferences too. We think about the Paris and Geneva and the Big Four and many other conferences. Let's think about some conferences now that God had, which these were uh, types off of, of what God has had. Uh, I think that the first conference that I can think of, now scripturally speaking, I'm going to call it God's uh, Eden Conference. God. Made man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. They were his beloved children. And they were put on the basis of free moral agency. The old infidel has said many times, Why would a just God do a thing like that and had all the suffering has gone through the age? God didn't do that. Man did that himself. God wasn't willing for him to do that. Well, then, if God was omnipotent, why did he let it even happen? Why didn't he make man perfect? Because in the beginning, there was nothing but God. And in God was attributes. His attribute to be a Savior. We know it so. He is a Savior. And that was in him, and there was nothing lost to be saved. In him was attributes to be Father. And there was nothing he could Father. In him was attributes to be a healer. There was nothing lost, nothing sick. So the only thing he could do was make man on the basis of free moral agency, knowing that he would do it. God didn't do it himself. Man done it himself. Yeah. And you're the same way this morning. You can accept life or turn life down. Yeah. But God made man thus that he, knowing he would do it, not willing that he should do it, but knowing he would do it, that it would display his attributes. So there's nothing out of time. Everything's ticking just exactly according to God's great timepiece. And this only displays his attributes. To select his children who really love him and believe him. And every man has an equal right. God being infinite, knew from the beginning what would be and what wouldn't be. So therefore he wasn't willing that any, but being infinite, it had to know. So therefore he could say that he would have a church without spot or wrinkle, because he knew he would have it. He's God. Now, in this lovely place in the Garden of Eden, oh, where man and women live together. God's a great contractor. Now, you have a lot of it here in, in Tucson, is this building. A few years ago when I was here, just a little bitty city, and now up there where I'm living, why the coyotes and papigos was going through there when I was here a few years ago. And now there's... Why, it's a big projects and houses and building on out, on out, on out, on out. Well, what's happening? See, contractors go in and buy a piece of land and subdivide it and build houses. Now, God did that. See, he, he laid out all the material to make our bodies while this world was being formed. Now, we're made of 16 elements. That's... Uh, potash and calcium and petroleum and cosmic light and so forth. And all this goes together to make the man. But that was here before there was a man on the earth. Yes. See? God made our bodies and laid the material out here before there was an earth. Now you're brought into it and you come here by God. And now you have the opportunity to live eternally if you so choose. That's exactly what Adam and Eve had. Ever, God cannot change. He has to remain the same. Give every man the same opportunity. Now, we find out God had pleased him when he made man. He looked at his, his uh, daughter and his son and how pleased he was with them. And then we find out that as soon as Adam and Eve had sinned and the message come up before God our Father, your child has fallen. From the grace. 
He's got away from you. My, how that must have alarmed his heart. And now notice the nature. When Adam realized that he was lost, when he knew that he had done wrong and it was made manifest before him that he was in the wrong. Instead of calling, Oh, Father, come to me. I'm lost. I've done wrong. I've been deceived. Come to me. He hid. And it was God going up and down the garden screaming, Adam, where are thou? Isn't that the same today? You can show man by the Word of God when he's failed. That's exactly what Adam knew he had failed. He had failed the Word of God. Amen. And you remember, it doesn't take a whole lot. You know what caused all this sickness and all this trouble and death and sorrow of 6,000 years? Because one woman just failed to believe one little sphere, a little phase of God's Word. Amen. Just one little iota. She believed most of it. Satan told her the truth about most of it. These things you'll do and this and that. said, surely you'll not die. But just to disbelieve one little iota caused all this trouble. Amen. Is that right? Yes. You think disbelieving one iota will take you back after it's caused all this? No, no sir. We've got to come to the Word. Amen. That's the only, and that is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And see, when God made man, when He began to brood over the earth, <clears throat> up come like Easter flowers, up come grass, up come species rising higher and higher. The great Holy Spirit brooding, or brooding means to be mothering, cooing, coo, coo. The flowers come up. The Father said, that's wonderful. Just keep it up. And He brood, and after a while, out come birds. And the next thing, out come animals. It kept getting greater, 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 greater. And finally, the earth reflected the reflection of him that was brooding. Amen. God. And he was in the image of God. Never did anything come higher than a man. Amen. Even to our beloved sisters, a woman, she's not in the original creation. She's a byproduct of the man. Yes. A part of him. And they're one in Christ. Oh, what a great lesson we'd have here right before us now that we could spend hours on, throw light upon. Notice, now we find out that then when this man reflected God, then God come down in his own reflection in the form of man, Jesus Christ. And God was in Christ. The re God in Christ reflecting himself to the earth what he was. Amen. A Savior. A God. A healer. God displaying his real attributes to a man which was his reflection. And God, in order to get this, couldn't come through sex, which first started the ball rolling. Amen. But he brought it through a virgin birth. Can't you see that, that first sin, what it was? Yes. Many won't agree with that. You hollered out the serpent seed, but there it is. Right. <laughs> now, the reflection. God reflecting himself in Christ. But then... When this man was lost, the day when man showed by the Word that he shouldn't do these things. Sometimes he's loyal to a church. If there's any of my Catholic friends here this morning, pardon this just a moment. My people are all Catholic too, you know. Roman Catholic. Now notice, when this priest come to me about many great healings, and he said, your background is Catholic. Why is it you're not Catholic? I said, I am Catholic. And he said... Oh, I can't believe that. I said, don't your church teach that this Bible, that Jesus Christ established the first Catholic church, and these apostles were Catholic? Yes, I said, then I believe just what they wrote. Yes. He said, but Mr. Branham said, the church keeps changing. He gave Peter the authority to, to uh, have the keys, and he can bind in the apostolic succession of the popes and so forth. I said, i got all your writings, or most of them, in there, the facts of our faith and so forth. But I said, look, if those men who wrote that Bible walked side by side with Jesus, say they were Catholic, and they wrote that Bible, don't you think they'd know more about the will of God and the commands of God than what this modern bunch would do today? And I said, notice, if it is the church, then when they obeyed what God said originally, and it is the Word of God, yeah. look at the miracles and signs and so forth they had, and you don't have them at all today. It's an evidence that God's not with you. 
He said, Mr. Branham, we're not supposed to argue. I said, sir, I wouldn't argue with nobody. I'm just asking you something. Then I brought up the Nazi council and so forth. He said, we're not to argue. He said, you're trying to speak of a Bible, of a word. He said, God is in his church. That's what the church was. This is what it is today. We're supposed to listen to church today. I said, God is in his word. Amen. He said, God is in his church. I said, he's in his word. If the word isn't in the church, then God isn't in the church. Because the word is God. And uh, I said, besides, do you believe the apocalypse, which means revelations, this is the Greek, uh, you believe the apocalypse is inspired? I said, certainly. I said, then Jesus Christ said himself in the apocalypse that whosoever shall take one word out of it or add one word to it, his part will be taken out of the book of life. Amen. Then how can you say that you have authority to take out, put in, or do what you want to when you're forbidden to do it by the founder of the Christian church, Jesus Christ? Yes. You can't do it. Oh, the hour, the tremendous time that we're living. And when man is told of their error, instead of trying to come back and say, Father, I'm wrong, forgive me, they still hide behind the fig leaves. Yes. Fig leaves is what they sewed together themselves. And they tried to, the word religion means a covering. And they tried to make themselves a handmade covering. And man hasn't changed yet today. So God had to call a conference. And he had to meet with his person, his child. And remember his commandments was the day you eat thereof, that day you die. And God cannot defy his own laws and be just. So he made a great chasm between him and man. So when they, he wanted to redeem his child, he didn't want him to go like that. So he had to redeem him. So they called a conference, and it was the first conference that God ever met with man, was the Eden Conference. How is he going to save that man? What can he do to bring his lost children back to him? And remember, his first decision is perfect always. If it would have been the creeds, the fig leaves, he would have said, Adam, you have done justly. Come on out from behind the trees. I think you're a wise man. You're reflecting me because you're wise. Your fig leaves is just right. Man's still trying that fig leaf. But God made a decision. And the decision was that it, something had to die because it spoke of him, his holiness and righteousness to his own law. The day you hear this, you die, and there had to be a substitute with a feeling. Amen. Botany life has no feeling. So he had to kill something in order to get skins to cover them up. And that was God's decision how to save man, to bring man back into fellowship with him at Eden, and it has forever remained that way. Yes. No man, I don't know how many times that they've tried to educate the man, they have tried to... Uh, tell him that uh, uh, an educational program uh, will do it. How many times has the church has tried that? It's failed every time and it will. Amen. We try to organize. Each fella. Have, now, I'm not against education, neither am I against organization. But the organization and educational programs and all the other that we've man-made is fig leaves. Yes. It's right. back to God's original decision at that first conference. Eden. Back to the blood. The Jew in the old days. Now I'm coming down home for Pentecost just for a few minutes. In the old days, when God accepted this substitute, how the Jew used to come down the road with his slick bullock and he'd say, You know, I'm a sinner. Jehovah requires me to offer blood. So he goes and gets his lamb or his bullock. He takes it down to the high priest, down to the temple, and he lays his hand up on his sacrifice. What does that do? That identifies the worshiper with his sacrifice. Yes. And the priest comes and kills the bullock and catches the blood and sprinkles it up on. And this worshiper, sincerely knowing this Jew, that that's what Jehovah required of him. The man went home with a good feeling, feeling the quiver and shaking of that lamb, the blood spraying all over his hands and so forth, and see that little fellow kicking and dying as his throat cut, he knew that he ought to be that one. He looked at his sacrifice. He identified himself by laying his hands up on it. I should be that one. 
And then when they cut its throat, it dying and bleeding and going on, and a little fellow quivering and quieting down, and the worshiper standing there and saying, Oh, Jehovah, you have accepted that instead of me. I'm ashamed of myself. And the man went home justified because he had done exactly what Jehovah required. That was fine. But by and by, it became a family tradition. Now he takes his sacrifice and says, Well, let's see now. Oh, yes, it's getting to be new moon feast. I guess I better it's a cleanse in the tabernacle. It's a feast of Pentecost. I guess I better go down and offer me a lamb. Go on down there and kill it with no feelings at all. Put it, go on back. The same idea had coming in there. And the man wanted to do. Jehovah said here in Isaiah, uh, speaking a little later on, he said, Your solemn feasts are become stink in my nose. We must come not like a bunch of uh, Rickies and Rickettas. We must come not like a bunch of formal uh, so forth if they had the day of these traditional religions. We are Pentecostals. Let's come with deep sincerity. Lay our hands upon our sacrifice under at Calvary and feel the bleeding and suffering of Jesus Christ as we identify ourselves that we are dead to the things of the world and its modern ideas of the day. We're as Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're living in that. Let the righteous spirit in us, these sins, vex our soul daily. Let the sins of the world and the fashions of Hollywood and all this Hollywood evangelism and nonsense, Amen. all this makeup and beat the music and jump up and down, the music Amen. stops, down you go. Amen. When a man's washed in the blood of the Lamb, he don't need music or nothing Amen. else. The power of God Hallelujah. just works upon him, and he can shout, scream, praise God, or do anything else, whether there's music or not. The Holy Ghost is in him. But he's identified with Jesus Christ. But today, we just want to... Uh, we have to jump around a little bit as Pentecostals because our forefathers did. They had something to jump around about. This Holy Spirit making them jump. And then when they come back down, always live as high as you jump. If you don't, don't jump at all. We come down today and live all kinds of lives. We bring a reflection upon the very thing that we're standing for. And our organizations are getting whirly. They're getting out there and letting our Pentecostal brethren get out there in these great schools. They're all right, nothing against them, but I'm only trying to show a point. They educate them and teach them uh, psychology and give them the B.A. and just like the rest of them does and send them out there. And what they are, they're absolutely, they're not Pentecostal. Amen. God don't have any grandsons. Amen. God has sons. Amen. We try to think our mother was Pentecostal, our daddy was Pentecostal, and all. we was brought up in Sunday school and automatically we we're Pentecostals. That's grandchildren. God don't have grandchildren. He has sons of God and daughters of God. And every man must pay the same price the first man paid. He must come under the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he must do. Now, we find out now that that's what, in the beginning, the sincerity... Now we try to think because we've got a young fellow here that wants an education. He goes out into the schools and so forth. He comes forth educated. He can speak real lovely. He can stand on the platform. He's a man of glamour. Well, that's Hollywood. Amen. They want something to shine. You want a man with a culture, with a fine education. You want a man regardless. It's a broad-minded that he can see. He don't care for the women cutting their hair. The Bible said for not to do it. Don't care for the, if a deacon comes into church, if he's a good man and can pay pretty good, they don't care if he's been married a couple times. That's all right. He's a good fellow. But the Bible refuses it. Amen. Exactly. Hallelujah. We don't come into the church by theology. We come in by neology. That's right. We come into Christ. But you see, today we've, we've got this idea that we want to go like the rest of them. That's what got Israel in trouble. We want to go like the rest of them. Our solemn feast of Pentecost has become just a form of worship. We all know that. And we see it getting, we mustn't do that. The thing we must do is get back and identify ourselves with Jesus Christ. Yes. Take His way and let Him work to us. Amen. And man will gladly follow Him who once taught, I'll draw all man unto me. How we'd like to go on for a little bit and express some more things on that Eden conference. But I've got some more conference I want to go to. For instance, let's have another conference. The Burning Bush Conference, I would call it. The Burning Bush. Now, God had a runaway prophet. When God calls a man to do something, he just might as well come to it or he'll be miserable the rest of his days. Moses started out. He was called of God. He was ordained for a job. And then when he started out, the people didn't believe him, so he just let the people go. He ran out and married some beautiful 
Ethiopian girl and got the hair, inherited a bunch of sheep and there he was out there and he lost all the vision of the people of the church of the living God. And God ordained him to do it. He raised him up, born from his mother's wombs, a proper child, and he raised him up for this purpose. No need of trying to get out of it. You go do it anyhow. And you just church members and you feel that there's something deeper in your heart. You'll be a miserable wretch until you accept that Christ like that. You've Amen. seen the real genuine Holy Spirit working in people. You'll be miserable until it comes to you. Amen. It's God calling you. Give yourself up. Come out behind the bushes. It's already settled. God made his way through the blood. He said, well, I belong to the church. I don't know mean them a bit more than if you belong to the rodeo. Not a bit. Nothing against the organization, but I'm not against the people in the organization, but it's a system. Now, notice this. Now we find this burning bush. God knew that that prophet was living in ease. So he decided that he'd have to speak to this prophet. So he selected a place. Emergency was on. I have heard the cries of my people. There's a man that has sent to deliver him, and he's weak and washy. Oh, God, I hope he calls one here this morning. The ministers... To get on fire. Look at the vision. We're dying. The world's gone. The church is backslid. God's trying to call a bride out. So he selected a place. Very odd place to us. It was a bush up on top of the mountain. But that attracted the prophet's attention. And he called him up there for a conference. Watch, he had to obey it word by word. Take off your shoes, Moses. The ground whereon you stand is holy. What if Moses said, Well, now, Lord, I just had some schooling. Honor is take off your hat, so I'll take off the hat. That would never work. When God said, Shoes, he meant shoes. When God said, Born again, he meant born again. He don't mean a handshake or a repeat a creed. Everybody's scared of that new birth. The devil substituted the handshake part or some kind of a psychic affair that would make you acknowledge, yes, I'm born again, but your life tells what you are. The life that's in you. You say you're born to the Spirit of God and deny one word of that Bible that shows you're not. Amen. You try to place it back on something else that shows it wasn't the Holy Spirit because he'd never deny his own word. Amen. You say, well, my church teaches that. There he shows you're not. You're born to the church, Amen. not of God. Yeah. This is God, his word. Amen. Here he is, Moses, the anointed. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Well, would my hat do just as well? He said, shoes. And that's what he meant, was shoes. Amen. God says, be born again. It means born again. Now listen, well, I'm in a mixed multitude and young children. But you listen to your doctor. You listen, I hope you listen to me and understand. Any birth is a mess. I don't care if it's in the pig pen or or it's in a pink decorated hospital room. Any birth is a mess. And so is a new birth. It's a mess. It'll make you do things you didn't think you'd do. But out of that death and corruption comes forth life. And no seed can bring its life until it's dead and rotten. And out of that rotten mess, when there's nothing else left around it, it's only the life that lives. When a son comes to God, he's given tests. I stood there that day, I remember, as I took my test. When I've been days after days, months after months, and years, four or five years on the streets, corners, preaching the gospel, and trying to do that which was right in God's sight. And he let my wife go right out from under me. My baby laying there dying, and I got down to the baby. I said, Lord God, don't let my baby die. Eight months, nine months old, little baby. I looked up and looked like a black sheep coming down. He even refused to hear me. He wouldn't even look at me. I raised up, about 23 years old. That laid the wife in the morgue. He refused to hear me for her. When I'd all I'd done, I said, God, tell me what I've done. If I've done wrong, punish me, not them. I said, what have I done? Work all day and preach all night and stand on the street corners and everything. What have I done? Tell me what I've done. He wouldn't even tell me. Then Satan come up to my side. He said, then you'll serve him when one word would change the whole situation. One word will save your baby, but he refuses to do it. He won't do it. When one word do then you'll go ahead and serve him. 
all the human reasoning, that's right. Why should I serve him if he won't even as much as just look down at my baby, that take all it takes, and as much as I thought I'd done for him, then he wouldn't even listen to my own baby. That's the hardest temptation. All human reasonings have broke away. Why should I serve him if he can't do that much for me? And I go day and night for him. And he even refuses to tell me what I've done. Well, the human reasonings is gone. But oh, when a man's born again, that's something in there that holds. It come down to that spot. When I thought, where did I get her? Where did she come from? What am I anyhow? Where did I come from? See, all the human part had broke away. Then that real genuine Spirit of God laid there. I walked over to her and put my hands on her head. She was suffering so bad to her. Her little eyes was crossing together. And I said, Sweetheart, in a few minutes I'll take you and lay you on Mommy's arms out there in the, in the morgue. I'll bury you out here under the pine trees and someday Daddy will see you again. I looked up. I said, God, though you slay me, yet I'll trust you. You gave her. You taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For then all my human reasonings had vanished. I was at the end of my road. But when you come to the end of your road, then there's that real Spirit of God there to take over at that time and lift you up. You must be born again. Everything has to die away. All your theology, all your thinking, all you ever was or ever expect to be, your life and everything else dies away. And then the Holy Spirit comes in. That's when you take off hat shoes. Stand before God. Nothing in my arms I bring simply to thy cross, I think. That's where Moses had to come. Where he could obey what God said do. The burning bush conference. Then God said, I'll show you my glory now. After he was willing to go. And he went out in Egypt. There's the Eden conference. There's the burning bush conference. Let's take another one right quick. Let's take the Red Sea conference. You know, right in the line of duty sometimes, Satan crosses our path. Minister brothers, you all know that. Christians, you know that, right? Here's Moses. Went down and showed the signs to Israel. The one that he showed the first two and they wouldn't listen. He goes back in a line of duty under the anointing of God with the very voice of God to speak things even into existence. He could call for flies. He used the voice of God. He said, let flies come. And there wasn't even a fly in the country. He walked on back. He knew what it would happen because he spoke the word of God. He walked back and directly an old green fly began to circle and then there were two pounds per square yard. Creative work that belongs in the church of Jesus Christ today or the blood of Jesus Christ. By His Word that we are in contact with Him. No difference the Word that we hear is here and it's God. We see Him stand there. We know it's Him speaking to us. Same thing. I've seen it done and I know it's right. It's with the Bible. There, Moses, given the authority, he went out and showed the signs to Israel and Israel come out with him. And here they are right in the line of duty. And there's a Red Sea cutting them off. Moses called a conference. God must have selected a place over behind the rock. Moses goes there and says, Lord, if you're walking in the line of duty, you've got a right to call a conference. That's what we come to pray for. That's what we're sent to the hospital for. That's what we go to sick bed for. Call a conference. Yes. Oh, my. I feel religious right now. <laughs> call a conference. That's what the Pentecostal people need today is call a conference. What's the matter? We slowed up. There's a wedge in the camp somewhere. Call a conference. Moses called a conference and said, Lord, I did just as you told me and here we're in a trap. Death is coming, moving up on us like a patient with a cancer. Death is moving up on us and Moses stood there until he had an audition with God. He stayed there until God spoke. He knowed his voice. He was a prophet. Amen. He said, why are you crying to me, Moses? I give you authority to take those people over and told you you'd do it. Speak to the people and go forward. <laughs> hey, Amen. man. Red seas begin to move and everything else. When God spoke the word, when the decision comes, what for him to do? I'm here. I'm up against it. What must I do? Speak and go forward. And the dead sea moved. Our time's getting away, and i uh, got so much different places I'd like to refer to. Let's hurry. Got several more, David and so forth. But here, remember, there was a Gethsemane conference come one time when God and His Son had to get together. After all, there was no one else could die for the sins of the world. There was nobody worthy to die. No man, every man in this world was born sexual desire. And that's what caused the turmoil at the beginning. That's what done it. Made us a high-bred creature. 
We're born of sex, human desire. It's hybrid. Something's been... That's the reason it's got death in it, as I spoke last night. But when God made His first man, He never asked woman and man to get together. He created him out of the earth. Amen. He was a genuine plant. His sin's what brought him to a hybrid. That's what's the matter today. The reason we're getting so many hybrid Pentecostals. You're listening to reasoning instead of the Word. Come back, people. Come back. Notice. Out there in the mixed-up crowds that didn't say this, it's between you, you Pentecostals sitting here, and us. We don't come here to be heard. I come here to try to help. I come here, if, I, if I'm just standing here to say, I, I spoke on a certain subject this morning, that makes me a hypocrite. I come here with a truth. And a truth that I want you to know, something that I believe God puts on my heart to help you that we can see the hour that we're living in. See, there's a Gethsemane conference when the only one that could die come up to the hour. And then when that great time come, there he had to make his final decision. No doubt the father said, are you still ready to go through with it, son? He said, is it possible, father? Is there some other man you could find somewhere? I love my people. I love the brethren that you've given me. Is it possible that some other man can... No. You're the only one can do it. You're the only one that's virgin born. You're the only one that's born without sex. No other man, no bishop, no pope, no cardinal, no nothing can help you. It's that one. You're the only one can do it. Then the conference was. Satan was standing there, ready to acclaim the human race. He said he had rights because they had sinned. As you people are sure had the tapes on the seven seals when the Lamb come forth to claim his redemption, what he had redeemed. Time was finished then. Yes. He's in the work now, doing the work of redemption, but someday he walks from the sanctuary to take up the book of redemption that he's purchased with his own blood. Then the hour is over. He comes forth then to claim what he has redeemed. Here he was standing in Gethsemane, that great suffering... The sin of every man was upon him. Everything that ever died, the death of that was placed upon him, and he was innocent, but he had to become sin. Can you, the Holy Son of God, take the sin of adultery? Can you take the sin, the punishment of adultery? Can you take the sin, the punishment of a lie? Can you take the sin of all these things, and can you bear him upon yourself, yet innocent? He is the only one. The conference is met. What did he say? Not my will, God. Thine be done. Oh, God, can we all hit a Gethsemane conference? That final checkup. And then there come another conference one time. A few days after that, about 40 days, there come a conference after his death, burial, and ascension. The Christian church is going to be organized. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, all of us. Listen now, just a minute in closing. There come a time when God was going to not only take a people like Israel is his people. Israel will be saved as a nation. The Bible said so, be born in a day. God deals with Israel as a patient, as a, as a people. But he deals the church with an individual. He's called out of the Gentiles a people for his name. Now, we find out that the hour come now. How must this church be run? They were forbidden, though they had preached, though they had healed. Listen to me. Though he, they had preached, though they had healed, though they had seen great signs and wonders, and though they were a witness that he was the Son of God, yet he forbid them to preach until they held this conference. Amen. Right. Wait up there at the city of Jerusalem. I'll send you word back how the Christian church should be operated. Hallelujah. I'll let you know. If I'm to have a bishop or a cardinal or a pope or whatever I'm going to have, I'll send you back. I'm going to heaven to hold a conference. Yes. You wait there till you hear the returns. Yes. Amen. 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 Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember when they was holding that Geneva conference, an old minister friend of mine, Dr. Pettigrew in Louisville, said he was listening to the radio, listening. The nation was at stake. He wanted to see what the decision was, what they were going to do. And some... Beat neck, come to the door with his hair hanging down his face and said, uh, Dr. Pettigrew, I understand that you're, a, uh, that you're an influenced man. So I, I've got some rock and roll songs that the people won't listen to me. If you'll just give me a little boost off, he said, son, stand out there just a little bit. He said, I'm, um, I'm listening to see what the returns is going to be. He said, but Dr. Pettigrew said, this is a great thing. He said, this means a lot to me. I can't mean any more than hearing the returns from the Big Four Conference. That's the way the people are today. Some little beatnik 
something other in the name of, of religion come around and try to attract your attention from here in the actual returns. Amen. 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 Some little sissified, pettified, religious side, if it's such a word to you. Getting more members and better people. Getting a bigger church and a bigger following. Trying to attract your attention, brother. Don't listen to them. Right. We've got the return road out here. Yeah. That's a Pentecostal conference. So don't you sing another song. Don't preach another word. But go up there and wait till this conference is over. I'll send you back the news. Yeah. I'll tell you who's the greatest among you. I'll tell you exactly what you're to do. Whether you're to have an organization, whether you're to have a pope or a bishop or whatever you're supposed to have. I'll tell you about it, but wait till you hear the returns we're going to have and to decide the thing. Amen. And he ascended it on high. Led captive, captive. Sit down by the right hand of God and sent gifts back to man. Then when the day of Pentecost has fully come, they've been waiting. Oh, what if it would have been? What if, if Andrew would have said after about six days, you know, brethren, I believe we don't have to wait any longer. I believe that by faith we receive our ministry. We should go ahead, start right out and start on our ministry right now. That's a trouble with a, many a minister. He don't stay there long enough till he hears the returns, till he hears his commission. Well, you know, maybe there would have been another name, Philip of God, and said, you know, I've been feeling pretty good. After all, we have a knowledge of this, what he wants to do. That might be so, brethren. You might have a B-A-D-D-L-L-Q-U-S-T, and it won't mean a thing. Your knowledge don't mean nothing. All your seminaries uh, just don't mean a thing. You've got to wait for the returns Amen. to see what God said. Um, no man's got a right to preach the gospel without meet, first meeting Jesus Christ Amen. as a person. Not as some theology, uh, theolo well, you know what I mean, some theological degree, theological degree. He has no right to do it upon that. No matter how much he can explain it, that isn't it. Just like Moses, he could teach the Egyptians wisdom. He's the smartest man in the land, but he had to go to the conference yeah. with God. Yeah. No man has a right to claim to be a Christian. No woman, no child, no preacher especially, until he himself has come up on that sacred sands where he met God. All the theologians in the world, all the infidels in the world can't explain that away from him. He was there. It happened. It happened to him. He knows where he stands. There. They went to the day of Pentecost. And we didn't see... Uh, uh, I, I'm not... I'm just making an expression. We don't see it there where the bishop come up the road with his satchel in his hand. And he said, Now, I have been sent of the Lord. I want to lay hands upon you, brethren, and send you out. That's the 1963 version of it. Amen. The bishop and his staff. Well, we think of then, let's just take it we would do regards to our Catholic friends. Let's say there come a priest up the road with the last rites, so-called. Lick out your tongue and take the wafer and I'll drink the wine. And then you'll be a member. If that would have been, it would have been the first place. Yes. God's infinite. His decision is just like it was in the Garden of Eden. He, his first decision settles it. Amen. Well, what did they do? They waited and they waited and they wasn't satisfied. They waited until... There came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. Yes. It filled all the house where they were setting. Cloven tongues set up on them like fire, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A bunch of cowards that was afraid of evangelism. A bunch of cowards that was afraid to face the dignity and the celebrity of the city and the religious critics was out in the street testifying. This is that. That was God's decision. A few days after that, the Samaritans, Philip, had went out and preached to them and baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ, though the Holy Ghost hadn't fallen upon none of them yet. So they sent up to Peter and brought him down. They know they had had great joy. They was happy and rejoicing. And they'd had a great time. And they'd had great healings and everything. Now Nazarene, Pilgrim, Holiness, Methodist, brethren, listen. Healing isn't it. Joy isn't it. It's the experience. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit, Christ Himself, coming in you as a person. They sent up and got Peter and John who came down and laid their hands up on them and the Holy Ghost came on them. And Acts 10.49, we find that Peter 
while he was speaking to the Gentiles. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard it for they heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. And Peter said, Can we forbid water, seeing these has, re- has ex- received the Holy Ghost like we did at the beginning? Paul, talking to a bunch of Baptists in Acts 19, passed through the upper coast of Ephesus. He finds certain disciples. They were happy. They had a great Baptist preacher there by the name of Apollos, and he was a converted lawyer. And he said he was proven by the Bible that Jesus was the Christ. And Aquila and Priscilla, tent makers with Paul, said our brother Paul's in prison down there. He had some place for a preacher to be. He's in prison because he cast the devil out of a fortune teller. And he said, hey, he's in prison, but he'll visit us pretty soon, and he'll explain the Word of God to you more perfect. And they were having a good time, like all good Baptists do, shouting, praising God, having healings and signs, and so forth. But when Paul come up and listened to him, I'm an apostle, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Amen. They thought they had it. <laughs> since you believe, we think when we believe, we got it. But that's wrong. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we know not what it be, where there be one. He said, unto what was you baptized? said, unto John. He said, that won't work no more. You've got to be baptized over. So he baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ, laid his hands up on them, and the Holy Ghost came up on them, and they spoke in tongues and magnified God. Yeah. How? Just like they did at the beginning. Yeah. The same formula was carried out. Amen. When a doctor writes a prescription, don't let none of these quack druggists try to mess with it, they get either too much antidote, it won't hurt, help you. And if they put too much poison, it'll kill you. Amen. Don't fool with God's formula. Carry it out the way it was at the conference. That was the order. Amen. 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 I love him. Reminds me of Jesus' parents. They went up to the Pentecostal feast. On the road back, they found out they'd been three or four days and they didn't find him among them. They began to wonder. That's about the way it is now. The churches is beginning to find what become of Jesus. <laughs> what happened? We're Pentecostals, but what happened? We're Methodists, but what happened? What become of Jesus? They begin to look among their kindred. And that's what we begin to think of. What did Moody say? What did Sankey say? What did Finney say? That was their day. Amen. We're on up the road. Yes. If we start searching back like they did, they went to their kindred and they couldn't find him. They went to the, all their kindreds, the bishops and so forth. They couldn't find him. Finally, they found him just where they left him. Amen. Where did they leave him? At the Feast of Pentecost. Yes. They had to go all the way back where they left him before they found him. Yes. And church, that's what we got to do. Go back where we left him. Amen. Get away from some of our traditions. Yes. Go back where we left him. If you want to know where you left him, have a little Bible conference. And just don't pull any punches. Just tell the truth. We're going to wait now till we see how it was. No bishops, no other Just the Holy Spirit was supposed to lead the church. That's the only leader we have is the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And he leads according to the Word. If you say, well, I got the Holy Ghost, and you deny the Word, it ain't the Holy Ghost, then, because the Holy Ghost wrote the Bible. Yeah. Right. So it isn't the Holy Ghost. Listen, closing. And world conferences, what do they do? They eat together. They talk together. They fuss together. They lie to one another at a world conference, of the conference of the world of the nations. But what, when God calls a conference, what's happened? They meet together. They don't feast, but they fast. They don't fuss, but they pray. They wait till they get orders and go forward. Yeah. That's what the church needs today is a going forward. Get the orders. And you say, well, how can I find the orders? Here they are. Yeah. Yeah. This is the orders. How do you know, Brother Branham? The way God first planned redemption was by the blood, and He'll never change it. Amen. When God makes a decision, that's the reason you can hang your soul on that Bible any phase it says, because it is the Word of God. And God being infinite, He cannot say, well, I was mistaken 2,000 years ago. God's eternal. He never did begin. He never will end. And the only way you can ever be like Him is be part of Him. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, that great pillar of fire, that had followed Israel, or Israel had followed it through the wilderness. See? That great pillar of fire was God, the angel of the covenant, Jesus Christ. Moses sustained the reproach of Christ, greater treasures than that of Egypt. So he forsook Egypt and followed Christ. Notice, on the day of Pentecost, what did God do? He taken that big pillar of fire and divided it. That was himself. Tongues of fire, forked tongues, cloven tongues. Come down, forked tongues, and set upon each one. Oh, wouldn't we ought to be ashamed to let our organizations divide us? 
when God divided himself among us that we might be one. Amen. This will all men know that you are my disciples. Do you hear that, brethren and sisters? God divided himself. We are never divided one another because we are parts of God. Does that this far come to this far? And after a while you'll find out it'll move that. It's come up through Luther, Wesley, Pentecost and find out the pyramid will be capped one of these days. You know, it never was capped. The pyramid on the back of your dollar. The great seal, it says, and we in America, here's the American seal on this side, but why do they say the great seal? The one that Enoch made. Not pyramid doctrines now because they don't believe in that kind of stuff. But they never did cap the pyramid. Why? The, the capstone was rejected, but it will come again someday. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And see, in that pyramid, I've been there. It's honed so close to even you can't run a razor blade. There's no martyr between it. It is perfectly set together like the same stone. And when that church gets honed into the perfect image of Jesus Christ, he will come. Resurrect all the saints when he comes and take them with him. The church of the living God will be caught up. But brethren, we'll not be like Eve. One have this and one have that, a disfigured body. It'll be word by word what God said. Say, Brother Branham, what did he say then? You never told us. All right? Peter spoke it. When they wanted it all, how do we get into this? What happened? He'd give us a farmer. Now, if he said, shake hands and join church, that's what it would have been. If he said, stand on your head, that's what it would have been. If he said, we'll organize a great man and make a great body and a great pope and a great this, that, that's the way it would have been. But what did he say? Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. And as long as God's calling, it's got to be the same formula. Amen. Not shake hands, repeat a creed, but be baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Jesus Christ. That's the way the Christian church is to be run. Not by creeds, not by denomination, not by education, not by theology, but by the baptism of the Holy Spirit to lead men and women. And He'll never lead you away from the Word of God. He'll lead you right to the Word of God because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Have you got about two or three more minutes for? i got another conference I'd like to call to you. i got wrote here. This Acts 4, it says, and I know what that means. Acts 4, after the disciples begin to preach, the churches begin to criticize. They begin to make them. The churches say, now, wait a minute. You go ahead and perform your miracles. You can do all this thing, but don't you preach no more in the name of Jesus Christ. They beat them into stripes and everything else. So what did they do? They've got to be something done. They're forbidden. The law says that they can't preach this way no more. Oh, brother, I wish I had just a little more time. The time's coming when you're either going to put your organization into the uh, World Council of Churches. You, if you do that, you take the image of the beast because you've got a power just like it was in Rome. And if you don't do it, you'll be an individual, independent church. And when you do, the image of the beast is going to close your doors and you're going to be forbidden and then you're going to need a conference. Amen. They tell us that we cannot no longer. We can't preach in the name of Jesus. Let's consult God and find out whether we can or not. Amen. So they went up and had a conference. Oh, excuse me. We need one like that this morning. Is it good for us to obey man or God, said the apostle. They had a conference about what we got this morning. And they stood up and gave the, the, the churches telling us we can't preach unless we come to their group and so forth. And we can't have this minister unless the organization says so. And no matter how much anointed it is, we have to do this, that, and you know how it is, each group and so forth. What are we going to do? And they had a conference. And they got down and began to pray. Yeah. That's Acts 4 conference. And when they did all with one accord, Lord, why did the people imagine a vain thing or the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Uh, stretch forth the hand of thy holy child Jesus to heal the sick. We're forbidden to do this and all of them praying with one accord. You talk, some people criticize us for everybody praying at the same time. How would you like to be in that group? Yeah. All in one accord. Somebody says, how can God ever hear that? How many prayers do you think He's hearing at one time anyhow? Yeah. You forget He's not finite. He's infinite. See? And when they all prayed in one accord, the Bible said the building was shook where they were sitting yeah. together. Hey, man, the returns come back. And they went forth preaching Jesus Christ everywhere. God working with them, confirming the words. Uh, Acts 4 conference. Oh, brother, just a minute. There's another conference. You might not attend any of these conferences. You might not attend these world conferences. Remember, you might not have done it. But remember, there's one conference that we'll speak of now that you're going to attend. I don't care who you are, you're going to attend it. 
You might be excused up to this time, but from now on, you're not. That's the conference at the judgment. That's right. You're all going to be there, every one of us. And we're going to give an account for what we've done set on this earth. That's one conference you're going to attend. Every time you hear a siren go down the street, remember, it marks you. You're not going to be here very long. When you see a gray hair coming, stooping to the shoulders, see a hospital, a graveyard, what is it? Testimony. You're not here for all the time. And you're moving up to that conference. And we're all going to be there. We're going to have to give an account of what we have done with Jesus Christ. Is that right? Yes. And who is Jesus Christ? The Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God working in three dispensations. That's the reason he spoke about calling the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. See, not three different gods. That's where you get mixed up. It's not three different gods. It's one God in three manifestations, yeah. see, of, of the one God. We only got one God. We're not heathens. See? But we, uh, we got one God, but three manifestations. That's the reason Matthew said, baptize them in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Because, see, it was a, what, that same God was in the Old Testament was the same God was made manifest and the same God is sure today. Jesus Christ, the same that Moses forsook the, the world in Egypt, the same that was sure today and the same that will be forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, and He is the Word. Amen. Amen. God's got to judge the church for something. God's got to judge the world by some standard. You believe that? Amen. Well, if he's going to judge it by the church, which church? Yes. If he judges it by the Roman Catholic, the Greek's gone. If he judges it by the Greek, the Roman's gone. Yes. If he judges it by the Methodist, the Baptist is gone. If he judges it by the Baptist, the Methodist is gone. Vice versa, if you judge it by the oneness, the twoness is gone. If you judge it by the twoness, the threeness is gone. If you judge it by the threeness, they're both gone. Yes. There you are. What is it? What is it, brother? It's a bunch of nonsense. Yes. God! has to have some standard. Right. If I had to join a church, which one would I join? There's only one. Right. And you don't join that. I've been in the Branham family 54 years, and I never did join the family. I was born to Branham. Yeah. I'm a Branham because my father's a Branham. Yeah. And I'm a Christian because my father is yeah. God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We're Christians upon that basis. Yeah. We're Hallelujah. Christians. We're born of His Spirit. And the Spirit of my Father in me, I have the attributes of God in me, and they display themselves like they did in His Son, Jesus Christ. There you are. Upon this rock I build my church. Not by flesh and blood has it revealed it to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed it. Upon this rock I build my church. If God judges the world by the Catholic Church of Protestants lost, if He joins it by, by the Protestants, which one? Be judged by the Catholic Church. It's many different uh, fears of the spheres of the Catholic Church. So which one is it going to be? You see, a person be confused. You wouldn't know what to do. But here's what God will judge him by. The Word, that's a standard. Heavens and earth will pass away, but my Word shall never fail. Upon this I take my stand. All other grounds is sinking sand. All other grounds is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other grounds is sinking sand. I'm depending on it. I'm not trusting in what I am. I'm trusting in what He is. I cannot, I cannot go to heaven. Jesus said I had to be perfect to get there. Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven. How can you be? But when you got, look not at you, but at your sacrifice. Well, if a little mule was born in time of the Old Testament, he had broke down ears and knocked kneed and cross-eyed, well, he didn't know he'd get knocked in the head. He's no good. But the mother could tell him, Son, you were born with a birthright. Because that you were born thus this way, you'll live. But the one that dies for you, you'll have to be a perfect lamb. will have to be offered so you can live. They'll break the neck of the, of, the, of the horse if he was no good. And he is no good. But you see, but a perfect lamb has to die so he can live. If you say you're no good, I ain't worthy to get healed, Brother Branham. I ain't worthy to come to Christ. Don't look at yourself. Look at your sacrifice. I'm no good. There's nothing good in me. Not even a thought. There's nothing no good. Nothing no good in you. There's none of us deserve anything but hell. That's exactly. But oh, look what stands to represent us. Look what stands to represent us. And here is his life in print trying to be manifested through us. And then through some little creed, we turn it down. Oh, we need a conference. Yes, that's the reason I can walk to the platform. Not being a fear that something's going to come up and go to happen this way or that way or it'll fail or something go wrong. No. I look at my sacrifice. 
Billy, what did you do this week? I've done enough to die I in an hour. I, I'm a sinner to begin with, but I'm looking who gave me the promise. I'm looking who said so. Yes. Don't you fear. Stand there for this cause you were born. I raised you up for this purpose. Then all devils in hell can't make me move. I'm standing there on Christ, that solid rock. Mm -hmm. Any of you remember Paul Rader? A great warrior of God. Now, as a little boy sitting at his feet, he died over here in California not long ago when he was dying. He and his brother Luke stuck together, like me and my son here. They went together just hand in hand, like brother and brother. This is father and son. And Paul come to the end of the road. Moody Bible Institute sent a little quartet down there to sing, and they had the blinds all pulled and shades down the hospital. And Luke had a kind of, I mean, Paul had a sense of humor, you know. And he looked around that little quartet and he's singing, Near my God to thee. He said, Who's dying, me or you? He said, Raise them curtains there and sing me some good snappy gospel songs. And they got singing down at the cross where my Savior died. Down there for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was a blood applied. Glory to his name. He said, That sounds better. He said, Where's Luke? The one who's stuck by me through thick and thin. He couldn't see his brother dies in the next room. They went and got him. Paul raised his big hand to Luke. And Luke took over his hand. The tears run off his cheeks. He said, Luke. Think of it. We've been a long ways together. We've tucked a many a briar pile through a many a ditch. But think of it. In five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ clothed in His righteousness. That's it. Paul told me, he said he, when he was a young man, he come from Oregon. He was a, a woodsman and he would uh, cut the trees. And he said when he was over in one of the islands, I forget where that, South America. That's where was. And he was missionary there. And he took this uh, black fever. Blackwater fever. No, you know what that is. That's death right away. Way back in the jungles, miles to a doctor. Paul was a great believer in divine healing, as you know. And so then he told his wife, he said, they was going for a doctor. He said, it won't make any difference. I couldn't live that long. So his wife said, honey, you get down here side of the bed and you talk to our doctor. Let's call him on the scene. So his wife began praying, God, don't let my beloved husband die. He's here in the mission fields for you. Don't let him die. Fever raging out of his mind nearly just going and coming. He said, honey, it's getting darker and darker. I can't last but a little bit longer. He said, just keep praying, honey. And he dropped off into a coma. He said he had a dream. He said he dreamed he was back in Oregon, a young man. And said he had a boss in a lumber camp. He said, Paul, go up the top of the hill there and fell me a tree of a certain size and bring it to me. He said, all right, boss. And he went up the top of the hill and said he could just see that action. The farther north you get, well, the softer the wood becomes. Farther south, the harder the same wood. So he went up there and he said he began to see the axe go way deep the bit into the tree as he fell the tree. He scraped it up and fixed it, stuck the axe in the trunk, down to the trunk of the tree, the big part, and was, you know, lifting to put his knees together to lift. said he's a strong man. You know, Paul was short, strong man. So he started to lift up the tree and he just couldn't lift it. He said, I tussled and I tried and I tussled. I had to take that log down there to the boss. He said, I just couldn't lift it. He said, I tuggled, tugged and pulled and tugged and pulled. He said, until I, my strength is just all gone. And said, I just sat down against the tree and thought, I am so worn out, I can't even move no more. He said, directly, I heard the sweetest voice I ever heard. It was my boss. And he said, Paul, what are you struggling with it for? He said, boss, I, I, I just simply can't. Pick it up. It's too great. The load's too great for me to carry. I can't go any further with it. He said, Paul, there's a stream going right by you. Why don't you just throw it in the stream and jump on it and ride right down the ripples? It comes right by the camp. He said, I never thought of that. And when he threw it in the riffle, he looked back and his boss was Jesus. And said he just jumped on the log and down over the riffles. He went splashing in the water. Hard. I'm a riding on it. I'm a riding on it. I'm a riding on it. And said he come to and he was standing right out in the middle of the floor, throwing both hands in the air, saying, I'm a riding on it, I'm a riding on it, I'm a riding on it. Nothing in my arms I bring, simply to the word I claim. Yeah. Brother or sister, there's no good thing in any man. There's no good thing in anything else but Jesus Christ. And I'm a riding on every promise here this morning. And someday I expect to ride into his presence upon the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us bow our heads. I'm a riding on it. I'm a riding on it. Not upon my affiliation, upon my denomination, upon my self-righteousness, but I'm riding upon the Word of God. I believe that through the righteous blood of Jesus Christ, someday I shall see Him. I shall be changed and made like unto His own glorious body. I shall be in His image. I shall see Him as He is. As I see the years creeping upon me, my little hair that I have turning gray, my shoulders stooping. I haven't got much longer. 
Thirty-something years I've been behind the pulpit. I only wish I had a thousand lives I could give for him. I wish I only had it. I love his people. What are you trusting in this morning? Some good work that you've done? Some church that you belong to? Are you really standing on the Word of God? Are you really experienced? Have you heard that? Have you had a private conference with God and the returns came back like it did on the day of Pentecost? Not some substitutionary, not some handshake, some mental confession, but upon the fire of the Holy Spirit coming into your life that changes all that you do and say. If you haven't had that, will you raise your hands and just say, pray for me, Brother Branham. I'm not, God bless you, God bless you, my hat's a hand. How about you Pentecostals? Some of you people that you know that just, just traditionally, you go to church and you like the music and you, you can act like a Pentecost, but actually right down at the bottom of you, you know there's something missing. You know there's something missing. If you want to really this morning at this breakfast table, you know, I may never see you again at another breakfast, but I want to see you at a supper when it's all over. You ever had that experience Will you raise your hands, say, pray for me, Brother Branham. I now want to become, God bless you, that's right. You say, does raising my hand do anything? If you mean it, it does. He'll see you. Now, you believe me to be his servant. Many people have called me a prophet. I don't claim to be a prophet. No. But if you believe that God speaks to me, you listen to me now. Sincerely, when you raise your hand, believe that. And watch what happens to you. Now, if you let me know what's in your heart. If he can tell me what you prayed about before you left home and what you did, the words you said, what you've done in your life and who you were and where you come from and what's going to happen to you hereafter, and it does, then surely he's speaking to me now. Let's have make this a conference this morning. What about it, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, Oneness, Tunis, oh, what, Church of God, Assemblies of God, whatever you are. Let's just have a conference. Let's see if we don't need a little love one for another. Let's see if that wouldn't kind of cure the thing, if we just had a little love and respect more for one for another. Will you do it? All right. Let's have one like Acts 4. And you confess everything that you've done that's wrong. And right over the table where you're at, that altar, where we ask the blessing, that's a family altar, the table, where you thank God for the daily bread. And remember, when you eat, because you eat, something has to die so you can live physically. Did you know that? If you eat meat, the animal dies. If you eat bread, the wheat dies. If you eat greens, the greens die. It's a form of life. And the only way you can live physically, something has to die so you can live physically. Isn't it just the thing, friends, to show you that fig leaves and man-made ideas won't work? Something had to die so you can live eternally. Something had to die. Not a church. Not It's, it's Christ died for you. Accept it now, will you? While we bow our heads. Each one keeping in your heart what you have need of. Till we meet, may God bless you. Heavenly Father, I've helped this lovely audience of people because I don't know. You know, this may be the last time. One thing, you may come before night. You may come before I could get back again. There's one thing sure, you are coming. I may die. I may have to leave the earth. There's many in here. If I should come a year today, from this day, there's no doubt people here that would not be here. They're gone on. This is our last time, Lord. We're going to meet. Some of us in here, we know this will be our last meeting here on earth. The next time I meet them, we'll be there at the judgment. And I'll have to answer for what I've told them as a minister this morning. I've put them to that word, Father. That's all I know to do. Now, there's many people that said... In this conference this morning, they want to talk it over with you. They're doing it now, Lord. They raised up their hands. They're witnesses. They, 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 they're tired, Lord. They're weary. And they know the world's conferences has run out. There's no more hopes. We can't build nothing. All the nations has atomic hydrogens and poison bombs and astronauts and everything, Lord. The whole world's quivering and shaking. It's going to be purified pretty soon. Get ready for a great millennium. She's going to shake like a... Uh, to pieces. She's tottering now like a drunk man staggering home at midnight. In the dark, she don't know where she's going. Oh, Father, but there is a foundation. There is assurance. For we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. I pray, Father, that each one will hurry to that kingdom this morning. 
in Christ Jesus. Bless them, Father, as they got their heads bowed, their hearts bowed. They're waiting now for the answer. We're in a conference. Send down the answer just now, Father, to everyone. Some of them need salvation. Some their first time. Some is... is they're, they're just going to forget their creeds. They, they want to find that the way it come down the first time. They want your decision, not the church's decision, not some creed's decision, but the Bible decision, the decision that God made in Acts 2 when He sent the Holy Ghost and fire upon the church. That was His decision, how the church must live and what they must do. Lay it aside everything else, Father. We wait for that decision. Oh, Lord. Send your power just now and baptize everyone. While we have our heads bowed. They were in an upper chamber. They were all with one accord. When the Holy Ghost descended, that was promised by our Lord. That's His word, promise. Oh, Lord, send your power just now. Pray now. Oh, Lord, send your power just now. Oh, Lord, send your power just now. And baptize everyone. Oh, Lord, send your power just now. I see ministers turning people around to the table to pray with them. That's right. The power just... Just don't think we're just standing here talking. He's here. Oh, Lord. If you Don't look up at somebody else. Close your eyes and look to Him by faith. Baptize everyone. Remember, they were in an upper chamber. They were all with one accord. Oh, when the Holy Ghost descended, oh, that was promised by our Lord. Here we are, all different creeds. Oh, Lord, we're in, a, we're in unity now. Now, believe now. Oh, Lord, send your power. Look at how he's been coming to us this week. Here he is right here now, right by your side, if you'll just believe it. Now and baptize everyone. Oh, Lord, send your power just now. Oh, Lord, send your... I give you my heart, Lord. I give you everything. Here's my hand. I, I consecrate myself to you right now. Send your power upon me just now. And baptize everyone. One again, oh Lord, sing it till it becomes a reality to you. See, now close your eyes, close your heart to all foolishness and all outside. Just now, oh Lord, send your power just now and baptize everyone. Oh Lord, send your power just now. Uh, oh, pray now, ask him for power just now. Oh, confess your fault. Lord, send your power just now and baptize everyone. Now, Father, I pray that you'll clean every heart. We confess our sins. We confess our wrongs. We've been wrong, Lord. All of us together, we're all guilty. We're short of the glory of God. Oh, God, won't you in mercy and pity look upon us, Lord? We're needy people, and we see the vision of the coming of the Lord. He's tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He's loosed the faithful lightning with his terrible swift sword. His truth, the Bible, keeps marching on, marching on. It marches over creeds. It marches over denominations. It marches over everything. Thy truth keeps marching on. Send your power just now. Oh, Lord, send your power just now. Oh, Lord, send your power just now and baptize everyone. Oh, Lord, send that power just. I believe it, Lord. I believe it. Oh, Lord, send your power 
just now. Oh, Lord, send your power just now and baptize everyone. While the music continues on and you pray, now if you clean your heart all out, all confess, you really laid it on the altar now. Now, he's the high priest of your confession. He can only, only help you as you believe it. If you've confessed your sins, if you've confessed your wrongs, if you've done everything, confessed you've been too dilatory, whatever you've confessed, now it's laid on the sacrifice altar. Now, put your hands upon Jesus and identify yourself. You identify yourself by faith. Lay your hands upon Jesus. And then when you do, look up to him and say, I receive it, Lord. I believe you now. I can, I will, I do believe. I can, I will, I do. You believe it with all your heart now. I can, I will, I do believe uh, that Jesus saves me now. Oh, do you believe it now? With your sacrifice on the altar. On the altar. What you've laid down. All your differences, you've laid it on the altar. Now, by faith, lay your hands up on your sacrifice, Jesus, who is sitting at the right hand of God to make intercessions for you, upon your confession that you believe with all your heart that He's accepted what you've offered to Him. If you believe that Jesus Christ has accepted what you've offered to Him this morning, I'll give you my life, Lord. I've been cold. I've been indifferent. I I've done things I oughtn't have done, but from this hour, I want to move up closer to you and I believe that I receive it. I lay my hands upon you now as I make my confession. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God heard your prayer? If you do, raise up your hands to God and say, I believe you heard my prayer. I make my confession. I believe you hear my prayer. Now I'm going to stand up and praise you for it. I'm going to give you thanks. Stand up on your feet now and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I believe you. I now give you praise for giving me the assurance in my heart. Now just raise your hands and praise God in an old-fashioned way, the way that God would have you. Amen.